church. What a great spirit this morning, and uh, I love that song. That helped me. There's no song, no song like a song about Jesus, because there's nobody like Jesus. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to show you Christ. Uh, now, I can give you the message, but the Holy Spirit will really have to take the, the blinders off, and that's what I'm praying for. Uh, when I finish preaching in a few moments, and I won't preach all day, I promise you that, and all God's people said, you know, help some of you feel spiritual. I know what time it is. When I finish preaching, I'm going to ask every person in this room, every person listening to me, uh, to join me in one of two prayers. You'll know which one is yours when we're done, but both of them bring us to Christ. I want you to open your Bible with me, if you will, please, to the gospel according to Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 10. You know, the great message of the Word of God is the message of the gospel. It's the good news. There's only one gospel. That's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, who died for our sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead. And Matthew shared it, and Mark shared it, and Luke shared it, and John shared it, and now Paul shares it in 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. We'll read the opening verses of this chapter we're going to study together this week. We've already found a little entry point in the Bible study hour with the opening words in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Let's all just pause right there and breathe a prayer to God. Dear Lord, help us not be ignorant today. But it is not something we're trying to come to know. It is someone. Read on. How that all our fathers were under the clouds. And all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Now, time out. Stop just a moment. Lift your head and look at me. Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going all the way back to Exodus chapter number 17. Literally, this is fascinating to me. Somebody said to me, are you an Old Testament guy or a New Testament guy? Yes, the answer is yes. He goes, all the Word of God reveals the God of the Word. They're not computers, they're completers. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is revealed in the Jesus of the New Testament. You can't divide the Creator and the Christ. So the New Testament just picks up right where the Old Testament left off and brings us to Jesus. And this is fascinating to me. But Paul is writing to people who were of Jewish descent, who'd come to faith in the Lord Jesus, and they knew the Old Testament. They knew the book of Exodus extremely well. They remembered the stories of their, their ancient ancestors coming out of Egypt and coming through the sea and being led by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They knew the story of them getting hungry in the wilderness and God gave manna for them to eat. And they knew the story of them getting thirsty and God brought water out of the rock. And so what is Paul doing? He's using their history, and he's using an object lesson to bring them to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. And so you come to the end of verse number 4. He said, they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. Now notice, please, there was a physical rock from which water came out, but that's not what he's talking about. May I just pause and say to you right now, I don't want to talk to you about physical things. I want to talk to you about spiritual things. Everywhere I go, people want to talk to me about politics and world affairs and, and governments and the end of the world and what's going to happen next and all that kind of thing. Let me just tell you, this is not the time to get fixated on what's going on with men. This is the time to get your eyes on the Lord. He's bringing them to the spiritual truth. And notice carefully, that spiritual rock, is rock capitalized in your Bible? Everybody look at it in verse number 4. Is it capitalized? Yes? Yes. There's a reason for that because this rock is not the object, is not the thing. This rock is a name. This is one of the great titles for our Lord. This is a person who is the spiritual rock. Keep reading. That spiritual rock that followed them. May I just ask? How many of you would be a little spooked out if you turned around and saw a rock following you? I mean, this is not terminology we usually use. Somebody said, I've never been chased by a rock before. Oh, oh, but you've been pursued by Christ. Because this rock 
was not that physical rock. No, it's a spiritual rock that followed them. And I want you to read, please, with me out loud, the last five words of verse number four, the last great statement. Would you? Ready? And that rock was Christ. Oh, I love that. Would you take your pen out and underline those words? That rock was Christ. So many pictures of Jesus all through the Old Testament. So many names and titles of Christ. Somebody said, why do there have to be so many different names and titles and prophecies and pictures? Would you like to know? Because nothing can perfectly describe how perfect Jesus is. The Lord's showing us like, like different cuts on the diamond from every angle, the beautiful light of Jesus. And he uses yet another beautiful picture of Christ. He says, you remember that rock? And all those Jewish believers are nodding their heads and say, yeah, we remember that story. We, we know that rock. You remember the water coming out of the rock? Oh, yes, we remember the water coming out of the rock. And Paul said, well, I want you to know that the one who was meeting their needs was not Moses. The one who was meeting their needs was Christ. One of the dangers in a special meeting is very often people put way too much stock in the preacher. <laughs> people come, they think, well, maybe, maybe this guest preacher, maybe he'll have something, something to say to us. And may I just tell you, you don't really need a guest preacher to blow through town. You've got a Bible preacher that preaches in this pulpit every Sunday. Church, aren't you glad you have a shepherd that preaches and teaches the Bible? A woman said to me yesterday, a kind member of this church, she said, this is the first place where I've ever been where they really taught me the Bible, helped me to understand the Scripture. I thought that was a great, a great compliment to the work that God has given you in this place. And if you're visiting today, may I just say, I'm glad you're here today and glad our paths crossed. Come back next Sunday and hear the pastor, would you please? And I want you to know, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I, I'm not a stand-up comedian. I didn't come to give you some motivational speech. I didn't come to, to tickle your fancy. I didn't come to tell you something you've never heard before. I came to tell you today that there's one person you need to know, and his name is Christ. That rock was Christ. All through Scripture, the Lord uses the rock as a symbol of the Lord. I think that's good because what is a rock? It's a symbol of strength. Isn't that right? A symbol of stability. I remember years ago, we, we live in the mountains of West Virginia. Any of you here from West Virginia? I'm just curious. Any fellow mountaineers among us? Anybody? How many of you have ever been to West Virginia? Would you raise your hand? How many of you know we're a state? Would you raise your hand, please? Yeah, it's good. And we live in the mountains, and, and there's a rock quarry close to where we live, and we were going to build a house, and a fellow was helping me, and they were digging footers, Pastor, and it was monsoon season, rain, rain, rain. He kept digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, and he said, my goodness, we've gone, we've gone way down. And finally, finally they hit what? Finally they hit rock. And he said, all right, now, now we can build. Because we understood something in that part of the world, if you don't hit rock, you've got problems. You've got to get down, down low where there's something stable and secure and unchanging. And i got good news for you this morning. There is one who never changes, and his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Isn't it wonderful that in a world that's always changing, Jesus never changes? So the same Christ that met the needs of the children of Israel in Exodus and the same Christ that Paul wrote to the Corinthians about and the same Christ that my granddaddy believed on is the same Christ I'm speaking to you about today because that rock was Christ and is the only firm foundation upon which to build your life. The Apostle Paul said, Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So go ahead. Go ahead and find you a beach to build on somewhere. Go ahead and find you some sand dune to build your life on. But I want you to know that when the storms come and the wind picks up and the rains fall and things start shaking under you, that will not be secure enough to build your life on. There's only one who is able to hold us fast, and that rock is Christ. Let me show you something interesting. Hold your place. We'll come right back. Put your left hand here. Don't lose your spot. And go over near the end of your New Testament for just a moment to 1 Peter chapter 2. 
Now, we're reading what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, but look what Peter wrote in 1 Peter because they said the same thing. They're, they're all pointing us to Jesus. Look, you don't need Moses, and you don't need Paul, and you don't need Peter, and you don't need Scott Paula. You need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 4, speaking of Christ. He says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. I don't know about you. I've never met a living stone. You ever met a living stone? We think of stones as being objects, and inanimate objects that just are immovable. That's the stone. He said, no, there's a stone that's living and breathing and speaking and moving and working. Why? Because that rock was Christ. Keep reading verse 5. He also is lively stones. He said he puts his life in you. Or build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You might mark in your Bible in verse 4, he's a living stone, so we know he's a person. But when you get to verse number 6, he says he's the chief cornerstone. What's a cornerstone? If you're a builder, you know a cornerstone is that part where two walls come together. Oh, I love this. This is, this is where all roads meet. All the roads lead to Jesus. Jew and Gentile meet together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the cornerstone? It's this strong stone that everything else hinges on. The, the cornerstone is fixed. It's immovable. It's the foundation stone. Everything else connects to it. Oh, don't miss this. Everything in the Word of God hinges on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything I'm going to say to you is built on the truth of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, it doesn't matter who you know or what you know. Christ is the one that must be known. And he says, he's building his church. By the way, remember, we're not talking about physical things. You have a lovely building here. It's beautiful. I'd say somewhere there's a cornerstone. And I want you to know the church Jesus is building is not a physical building. It's a spiritual building. We're a part of it. We're all connected. How are we connected? We're connected in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one who holds everything together. We're getting ready to return to Israel in a few months, God willing, on a Bible study tour. And the last time we were there with a group of people, we were walking through the old city of Jerusalem. If you've never been there, you ought to go. It's fascinating. It makes the Bible come alive. And we we're walking through the old city of Jerusalem, and we had a tour guide, and we'd come down by the western wall and observed all of that. And, and we were making our way around, and we came down to a place where they were doing an archaeological dig. They're, they're always doing archaeological findings there. And we came to a place where it was clear they were doing some excavating and some work. And the, the man said, now this is going all the way back now to the time of Christ, and this is going all the way back to the Bible times, this foundation here and all of these ruins, and he's pointing things out. And I noticed something off to the right. It was a, a beautiful stone, and it was, it was obvious it had been polished, and it was, it was cut a certain way, but it was cracked right down the middle. And I said to our guide, tell me about this. And he said, that's very interesting. He said, when Jerusalem fell in AD 70, when Titus came in and, and just kind of crushed everything and put it in ruins, he said, that was the cornerstone. And he said, that cornerstone would have been at that time up on the top, not at the bottom, on the top of this particular wall. And he said when they knocked the walls down, that cornerstone fell. And when it fell, this is where they found it. He said it was cracked right down the middle. And immediately my mind went to this point in Scripture because I love this thought. Look, please, a physical rock might crack. It, it, may, it may split in two. But our Christ is the chief cornerstone, and I got good news for you. He has never fallen, and he is not broken. He's as strong and stable and secure as he has ever been. You want something to anchor your life on? Connect it to the person of Jesus Christ. They say 
that in those days when they built the temple, that they would take stones and they had to be chiseled and cut and polished a certain way. And if something didn't quite fit, they would just set it aside. It was disallowed of men. It was set to the side. I love this language Peter uses. He said, I want you to know that God came and took the very one that you rejected, the one you thought didn't fit your religious ideology, and he made him the chief cornerstone of the whole thing that he's building. I'm going to tell you, we don't don't need more religion. We need more Jesus. People need Christ. And if you don't come to know him, keep reading. Look at verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he's precious. But unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallow, the same is made. The head of the corner, and look at verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Do you see what he just said? He said the same stone believers build on is the same stone that unbelievers trip over. If you're in here today and you really know Jesus, I mean you really know Jesus, then while I'm talking right now, there is on the inside the witness of the Holy Spirit that confirms the truth which you've already put your faith in about who Christ is and what Christ has done in your heart. And you say with old rough, tough, cussing, transformed fisherman Peter, Jesus is precious to us now. But if you're not a believer, the real sticking point is Jesus. Because see, there's a whole lot of people who want to be good moral people, they just don't want Jesus. They'll even take church. They just don't want Jesus. They'll even take a historical Christ and they give mental assent and acknowledgement that he existed, but they will not humble themselves to acknowledge their own need as a sinner for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, without Christ, there is no life. Without Christ, there is no heaven. Without Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without Christ, there is no hope. There is no peace with God. The whole thing hinges on Christ because that rock was Christ. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, this symbolism is used for Jesus All the way back, all the way back in the Old Testament, he is referred to in Genesis chapter 49 as the stone of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, he is the stone of Ebenezer, the stone of help. I love this. When you come to Daniel's prophecy, he's the stone that Daniel saw that was cut out of the mountain And like a landslide, men didn't make it happen. God made it happen. He came rolling down out of the mountain, and he crushed all the Gentile world kingdoms. I'm just going to tell you what's getting ready to happen in this world. People say, what's this world coming to? I'm telling you, Jesus is coming to this world. Someday soon, every king, every president, every prime minister, every dictator, every congressman, and every senator will bow at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus and give acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As surely as Christ came the first time, Christ is coming again. And when he comes, he's going to crush every government that does not yield to his lordship. And I wonder, do you really know Jesus? I'm not asking, do you know about him? I'm asking, do you know him? See, there's two kinds of people in this room. There are some who've never really known Christ as their personal Savior. You may have been in church your whole life, but you don't know in your heart that you have absolute peace with God. I'll tell you what you need. You need Jesus. Look to Jesus and be saved today. Look to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, the beauty and the glory and the wonder of what it means to know Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. Look to him in faith today. And then there are those in this room who know the Lord and you've been saved, some of you for years. But it's been a little while, hasn't it, since you got a fresh glimpse of Jesus. I want to say to you in the words of the hymn writer this morning, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm just testifying right now. Increasingly, I want to talk less and less about other things and more and more about Jesus. You know why that is? Because there's nobody like Jesus. Somebody said, you ever get tired of preaching on Christ? Never. Never? Oh, I get stale sometimes, but he's perennially fresh. The water's always flowing out of that rock because that rock is Christ. What do we know about him? Well, go back with me to 1 Corinthians 10. Let me give you just a handful of thoughts. They all come from these verses, these opening verses we read together. 
Number one, I want you to write down somewhere that that rock was firm. That's the first thing we know about the rock. It's firm. Men don't make a rock. God makes rocks. We have at our house a certain place, uh, some, uh, some man-made looking stone. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's a composite. It is something that men have come up with as a substitute and a little less expensive than if you're using actual stone. But how many of you know it doesn't hold up quite as long? After a while, it begins to weather and begins to chip and fade, and sometimes it falls off. Can I just tell you, that's not true of Jesus. Religion does that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It dresses up for church. It goes through all the motions. But I'm going to tell you, after a while, it starts to weather a little bit. Not Jesus. Jesus is the firm, unchanging one. I've got to show you a verse. I've got to show you a verse. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy for just a second. Remember I told you all this started in, in Exodus, that rock that they drank from when they were thirsty? Uh, look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Have you ever noticed this? Deuteronomy is the book of the second law. It's a repetition of what was given in Exodus. And near the end of Moses' life and near the beginning of Israel going into the promised land, he repeats some things that he doesn't want them to forget. And in Deuteronomy 32, there is a beautiful song. It's called Moses' Song. It's one of the first songs recorded in Scripture. I'm not a singing preacher. I wish I was, but... Moses was a singing preacher, and he took off singing, and he sang all about the glory of God. But come down to verse number 30. He said, how should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? Do you see that rock is capitalized again? Because it's a person, and he tells you who the person is. The rock is the same as the Lord in verse number 30. And then look at verse 31. Oh, I love it. Deuteronomy 32, 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Notice in the verse, their rock is not capitalized. This world has lots of rocks it builds on, lots of things people build their life upon. Fill in the blank. Put put whatever rock you want to in the space. I want you to know that rock is nothing like our rock with a capital R because there's nobody like Jesus, you see. Stones have all kinds of constitutions and different levels of strength and usefulness. But I want you to know there is one rock that is firm and unchanging in his character, in his nature, in his work, in his promises. Who is that? That is the Lord Jesus because that rock is Christ. Go back to 1 Corinthians 10. I'll give you a second truth. Write this one down. Not only was that rock firm, but secondly, and this is really important, that rock was flowing. Look at the story, would you, in verse number 4. It wasn't just a rock. It was a rock out of which water flowed. The story is found in Exodus chapter 17. And they were out in the wilderness. I've been in that wilderness. And imagine looking at those Bedouin people, what it was like for millions of Jews walking through that wilderness and looking for water. And they were thirsty. And they started grumbling a little bit one day. And the Lord said, I got this under control. And he said to Moses, there's a rock over yonder. Go to that rock. And when you get to that rock, just smite the rock. Just hit the rock. Take your rod. You know the rod that he used in the plagues and the rod that he held out over the Red Sea? Take that rod and hit that rock. And when that rod hits that rock, water's going to come out. How many of you know that's not normal? May I just tell you, salvation is not of man. Salvation is of the Lord. This is not something natural. This is supernatural. Look, I'm not trying to be spooky or mystical, but it is spiritual. I'm telling you, you have a spirit, and the God who is a spirit is the only thing that can do for you what you need done. You can't do it for yourself, and nobody else can do it for you. Only Christ can do this. And so Moses takes the rod. It wasn't the rod that got it done. You think the rod was that strong? No, God was that mighty. You think Moses was some Herculean kind of guy? He hit the rock with such force, water came out. That's nonsense. Look, he just did what God said. When he obeyed God, God met the need. Oh, how wonderfully sufficient our great God is. 
And the moment he hits that rock, immediately water starts bubbling up and flowing out of the crevice of that rock. Enough water, it flowed continuously so that everybody in the nation of Israel living in those tents in that parched, barren wilderness was able to quench their thirst. And I came to tell you today that our smitten Christ, smitten on the cross, hit at Calvary with the wrath of Almighty God, is the only one who can give living water but thanks be unto God, there is more than enough for every thirsty soul to have their quench, their thirst quenched. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 4 to that woman at the well, you want water so you never thirst again. She said, I'd like that water. Give me a drink of that water. Did you ever notice Jesus' answer? He said, you don't just get a drink, you get the whole well. When you get Jesus, you get a well of water inside of you springing up into everlasting life. You know what a spring is? Something that's always fresh. How many of you have lived long enough to know we get a little stale? Good news, Jesus never is. We get weary. We get wounded. (laughs) We drink from broken cisterns and stagnant ponds sometimes. And we think, that was no good. Good news, Jesus is still flowing. My grandpa Martin was a World War II veteran. He was a coal miner, farmer. Great man, taught me to drive a tractor and lots of things out on that farm growing up. And one day he took me to a certain place on the farm I had not been before. And at the base of a giant oak tree he had, he had dug out, <clears throat> and there was water bubbling up. I didn't know it. It was a mountain spring coming right out of the base of that mountain, right at the foot of that oak tree. And he said to me, now, son, I'm going to show you something. He said, uh, I've had this water tested. This water's clear and clean. He said, if you ever need water to drink, can't get water, come here. I walked by that the other day out on the farm, thought about his words. We had a couple catfish ponds. We never drank out of those. Can I just tell you that? But he said to me, this is clean, clear, fresh water, always flowing and perennially available. You know what this world is? I'm going to tell you what this world is. This world's an old, dead, stale, stagnant catfish pond. Go ahead and drink out of it if you want to. But Jesus said, no, I will give you living water. I'm going to give you a well that's always springing up. John 7 said, when you believe on Christ, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. It's pretty good. Look, you come for a drink, you get a well, you find out it's a spring, and it becomes rivers. That sounds pretty good to me. What do you think? It means there's no diminishing of Christ. Christ is all sufficient. I don't know the needs in this room today. There are physical needs and mental and emotional and financial and marital and most of all spiritual. But I came to tell you, Jesus Christ is more than enough. Run to the rock. You won't have to go far. He's been following you to right where you are at this moment. That rock is Christ, and he is more than enough. What do we know of Jesus? Well, we know that rock was firm, and we know that rock was flowing. But let me give you a third thing. That rock was following. In other words, he has come to right where you are. People say to me sometimes, oh, preacher, I'm just so far from God. (laughs) Well, you may be far from where you need to be, but you're not really far from God because God is the great pursuer. Most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23. How does it end? Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know what I've discovered? There have been times I ran from Jesus. Stupid. Just dumb. Excuse me. I just ran as far away from him as I possibly could like sinners do. But here's what I have discovered. Every time I did that, the moment I stopped right where I was and just turned around, I didn't have to go all the way back to him. The moment I turned around, Praise God. He was standing right there staring me in the face. You know what that is? That's mercy. That's the goodness of God. He's following you. He said to those early disciples, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. What's that mean? The end of the age, the end of time. 
till time is no more, till you get to eternity. Christ is still here. Christ is still at work. Let the blasphemers and the naysayers and the prognosticators say there is no God and there is no Christ and there is no hope. I tell you, Christ is following after sinners at this moment. Men don't follow after God. How many of you are glad God follows after us? He does. He says he would never leave us and he would never forsake us. <laughs> Get a little mental picture in your mind, would you please? I want you to see a rock following along after a whole bunch of people. Somebody said, that's a little humorous. No, that's wonderful is what that is. Because that rock was Christ and Jesus was after those rebel Israelites when they didn't deserve it, when they weren't searching for him, and when they didn't appreciate it. Aren't you glad the Lord still loves rebel sinners like us? A bunch of ingrates sometimes, you know. We fuss and grumble and complain, give no thought to the goodness of God. But I'm just going to tell you something. Wherever you are today, Christ has come right where you are. As a rock, he is immovable, unchanging. But as a rock that followed them, he is always in pursuit. His character never changes, but he is always after sinners. That rock was Christ. There's one more thing you must get because this is really what the passage is about. That rock that was firm and flowing and following was also forgotten. That's really the context of 1 Corinthians 10. This is awful. See, this passage reminds us of the faithfulness of God and our own failures. That's what this is. It's a remembrance passage. He's, he's taking them back to use history to stir up their minds a little bit to make them think. How many of you know memory can be a good, a good prod at times? And that's what he's doing. He's stirring them up by way of remembrance, and he's saying to them, do you remember how God took care of those people? Oh, yes, we remember that. Do you remember how those people forgot him? Look at verse number 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Think about this. I mean... He brings them out of Egypt. He puts all the plagues on their captors. He delivers them. He brings them across that water on dry ground. He meets them when they get to the wilderness. He gives them manna from heaven to eat and water out of a rock. Somebody said, I'm going to tell you, if God did all that for me, I'd really serve him. Oh, really? Because God's been real good to all of us. Funny how we can spot the sin of others and miss our own. Oh, the forgotten Christ. The forgotten Christ. Dear Lord, forgive us. We've forgotten Christ. You know what's great in any church? Only Christ. You know what's great in any sermon? Only Christ. Is there no Christ in the sermon? Let it not be preached. Is there no Christ in the song? Let it not be sung. Is there no Christ in our life? Let it not be lived. Because it is Christ and Christ alone who brings all the resources of God to us and all the fulfillment the Lord has for us. Lord, forgive us for our forgetfulness. Oh, the sin of forgetfulness. That's the great sin. That's the soil that every other sin grows in, the garden of forgetfulness. Think how we have forgotten how wonderful Jesus is and how needy we are. The writer of Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me was the old converted slave trader John Newton. He became a mighty gospel preacher, and near the end of his life, he got dementia, and his mind started to, to slip a little bit, and he couldn't remember people's names and places and dates. He couldn't remember much. And one day they asked old Mr. Newton, they said, Preacher, is there anything you do remember well? They said, Just like that. He said, Oh, yes, there are two things I remember. I remember that I am a great sinner, and Jesus, is a great Savior. I'm going to tell you what we must not forget. We must never forget who we are and we must never forget who Christ is. Do you understand you can be in the presence of Christ and miss Him? Now listen to me carefully. I told you this passage started in Exodus 17. That's true. It ended in Numbers 20. 
You know what happened in Numbers 20? They got thirsty again. You know what God did? Sent them right back to the same rock. By the way, I love this thought. I love this thought. The same Christ that saved sinners, who brought you eternal life, the moment of your salvation is the one we go back to again and again and again and again and find he is more than enough for every need. I'm going to tell you what a revival is. A revival is when God's people fall in love with Jesus all over again. Run to Christ. Run to the rock. And so Numbers 20, he sends him right back to the rock, and he says to Moses, Now, Moses, you don't have to hit the rock this time. Just speak to it. How many of you remember that story? And Moses, he got mad. Do you know spiritual people do fleshly things sometimes? He was a God's man. They got ticked off at the people. And standing there, he took that rod, and he hit that rock twice. Wasn't supposed to do that. See, that rock was Christ. It was a picture of Christ. Don't miss this. That rock, Christ, was smitten once, never has to be smitten again. Jesus is not on that cross today. He paid your sin debt in full. When he said it is finished, it was finished. It was all done at the cross that day. He was smitten once. And when you come back to him, all you have to do is speak to him. Can I tell you what Christ wants from you today? How many of you would be interested if I could tell you what Christ wants from you? How many of you would be interested in knowing? I'm going to tell you what he wants. You ready? Same thing he's always wanted. He wants people to come to him and speak to him and believe that he is more than enough. That's the whole thing. That's the bottom line. And you know what's interesting to me? It was at that same rock where Moses sinned and missed the promised land. It was at that same rock where the people doubted if God could meet their needs again. Isn't it funny that we can be in the presence of Christ and miss Christ? I know, I know you're in church on Sunday. Great, congratulations. But you can sit in a church building on the Lord's Day and miss Jesus. And I came to tell you today, if you miss Jesus, you miss the whole thing. It, look, if we're just having a meeting to have a meeting and going through the religious motions and mechanics of it all, let's just close our Bible now and all go on home. Let's close the door, shut it down. We won't be back tonight. We won't come Monday. We won't come Tuesday. If we don't come to know Christ, we miss the whole thing. But if we can all just come to Jesus. See, that's what's getting ready to happen in this world. The whole world's getting ready to come to Jesus. Real soon, every eye is going to see him. And I, I think it might be good if we didn't wait to the end of the world to see him. How many of you are with me on that? might be good if we turned to him now and spoke to him now, and believed on him now, and trusted him now, and depended on him now, and built on him now, because that rock was Christ. Years ago, we were in Amman, Jordan. It was after the fall in Iraq, and... There was some liberty, some measure of liberty. And a group of, a group of believers out of Iraq had come to Amman, Jordan to try to learn more about how to preach the gospel and how to build churches. Someone asked my father and I if we'd be willing to go spend a few days, 10 days I think it was, and just teach. And we did. It was fascinating. We take a lot for granted, you know. I sat in the back of a building with a group of men around a table, and they just soaking it up, man, taking notes faster than you could, you could speak. I mean, they just soaking it all up. They just wanted to know, how can we tell our people about Jesus, and how can we start churches? They had a little window of freedom, a little moment to, to get something going there in that part of the world. Stirred me up. We were inundated with those people men and those meetings the whole time and finally we were just going to be there another day or so and the Jordanian pastor who had hosted us said look you can't be here and not see a few things before you go back let me let me take tomorrow and show you some things I'll never forget it he put us in a car and uh, drove us about a hundred miles an hour through the desert drove like a maniac he wanted us to see as much as we could see he showed us the Dead Sea it was fascinating Jordan River from that side. He took us to Petra. You read the Old Testament book of Obadiah, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, full of pride. That's where they lived. 
Not just history, there's a lot of prophecy there. That's where the Jewish people will flee to when the Antichrist is doing his worst during the Great Tribulation Age. And it is fascinating. You've seen it on movies and didn't even know what you were looking at. You walk through, you walk through this crevice only one way in. That's how they kept all their, all their predators and captors out. And they would sit on top of that wall and shoot at them and throw rocks down on top of them. And it was, I don't know, maybe maybe a half mile in or something between this rock canyon. And, I mean, huge, sheer face rock on both sides. And finally, you come around the corner and you're standing looking at an ancient temple that was carved into the, into the walls. And I'm standing there just dumbfounded looking at it. And the guide says, look to your right. And I turn to the right. And as far as you could see was this massive rock city. I mean, just houses and, and places of employment carved into the face of the rock on both sides and little donkeys carrying people up, little tiny crevices up the face of the rock to these places. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Then he put us in a car and he drove us up on Mount Nebo, to Pisgah. It's where Moses looked over into the promised land. God let him see it. He disobeyed. He wasn't going to go in with the people, but he let him see it in mercy. It's where Moses died, and God buried him. And no man knows the place of his burial, except for the Greek Orthodox. They know where he was buried and charge you, I think, $15 a head to see it, something like that. But other than them, the Bible says nobody knows where he's buried. We're standing there looking over into the promised land. I'm just imagining all this. And we walked around to the other side of Nebo. I'll never forget this. And I'm looking out into, into barren wasteland. It's just desert as far as you can see. No cities, no greenery. And our Jordanian guide said to me, now this, Brother Scott, is the, is the desert the children of Israel walked through right here. This, this was the path they took. And I'm, I'm envisioning, you know, these millions of people God meeting them in that wilderness and leading them and powerful. And off in the distance, I saw this little green spot. It stood out. It was the only green thing out there. Way off in the distance. It's just a very green area. And I said to the man, tell me that, that right there. What is that? He smiled. He said, I wish I had time to drive you down there. He said, it's fascinating. He said, there, there is this one little area there that is lush and green. He said there's flowers blooming. There are palm trees. It is literally what you think of when you think of an oasis in the desert. And I said, that's interesting. I said, How, how'd that happen? He said, well, that's interesting. He said, right in the middle of that oasis, there's a huge rock. He said it's split right down the middle. And he said, for centuries, water has been bubbling up and coming out of that rock. And I said to him, is that the rock? And he said, we don't know that. He said, there's been a lot of debate about it. Some people have surmised that it is. And he said, some people have said historically, this was not the area of the wilderness they would have been in when they, when they drank water from the rock. He said, but I'm going to tell you what it is. He said, it's one of the greatest object lessons of that truth in the whole Bible. He said, because it is possible in the middle of a wilderness to have a rock flowing with water that meets all the needs around it and makes an ugly place very beautiful. And may I say to you, that rock is Christ. And we're living in an ugly, messed up world right now. And maybe your life isn't exactly what you want it to be. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is wonderful. And if you will let him, he will meet your deepest needs. Our Father, I thank you for Christ. I thank you for the word of God that points us to Jesus. Holy Spirit, give us understanding hearts now. Our heads and hearts are bowed before the Lord. Before we have any music at all or any movement, would you just sit very prayerfully and quietly for a moment? See, to me, to me, the most important time is not just the preaching, it is the response to the Word. In fact, it would have been better off for you have not even heard the preaching than to hear it and not respond rightly to it. 
A few moments ago, I said I was going to ask everybody here to join me in one of two prayers. That's what we're going to do right now. Through the Bible, God speaks to us, and through prayer, we speak to Him. I'm going to ask you to talk to the God who's been talking to you in just a moment. May I ask a question or two? I will not embarrass you. I don't know what you are accustomed to, perhaps in other places, but I will not come after you. I will not point you out. I don't like to be humiliated. I won't humiliate you. But I'm going to ask you to be an honest man, an honest woman, an honest young person. It's dangerous to lie to God because God already knows, doesn't he? Will you be a truthful person today? How many people in this meeting would say, Preacher, if I died right where I am right now, met God like I am this moment, I'm absolutely certain that my sins have been forgiven and Jesus lives in my heart. I know he has saved me and I know I'm ready to go to heaven like I am. There may be other things I'm wondering, questioning, but I'm not in any question about this. I know that I belong to Christ and he belongs to me. No one's looking but this preacher. I'd like you to slip your hand up in the air with mine right now. Would you please hold it high? And with your hand lifted to heaven, would you thank the Lord for that right now? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, you couldn't say that. Just thank him for being your Savior, your Christ. Oh, it's wonderful to know Jesus. You may lower your hands, and I must ask this question because some of us couldn't raise our hand, honestly. May I thank you? And I thank you for telling the truth, not lying to the Lord. May I ask you to be honest again? Who among us today would say, Preacher, if I died like I'm sitting here right now, or Jesus came in the next 60 seconds, I'm not absolutely certain about my relationship to God. I'm not positive that my sins have been forgiven and that Jesus is really my Savior. Preacher, I am not 100% sure of heaven, but I am certain of this. I don't want to go to hell. Preacher, would you pray for me? I won't embarrass you. You'll say, Preacher, that's me. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I know I don't want to be lost. Pray for me. I'd like you to slip your hand up in the air with mine just for a moment. Would you please? Long enough for me to see it. I see you. Thank you. And you, and you. Who else? Pray for me, preacher. Not sure about my standing with God. You may lower your hands. If you just raised your hand, or you didn't, but you know you should have, would you listen to me for just a moment? God loves you. And Jesus Christ, God's Son, died in your place for a reason so you wouldn't have to go to hell. If you go to hell, it won't be Jesus' fault because he paid for your sins and he rose from the dead to prove it. And he's alive and he wants to come live in you. Do you believe that? Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe he rose from the dead? Like the Bible says, do you believe that? All right, the Bible says if you believe that, and you're willing to confess him as your Savior, he will save you. That's what the Bible says. I'm not asking you to become a member of this church. I'm not asking you to turn over a new leaf, try harder and do better. You can't do that on your own. I'm asking you today, would you be willing to acknowledge you're a sinner and believe on the Lord Jesus for your salvation? We'll give you a verse. If you're not sure you're saved, would you listen to this verse? Take this verse and make this your verse today. Romans 10 verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means anybody. Put your name in. If you will call on the Lord today, He promised He'd save you. If you will confess your sin and confess Him as your Savior, He will keep His promise and forgive your sin and come into your life. You can guarantee He'll do His part if you'll simply open your heart to Jesus. I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that today. Here's the first prayer. Remember I said one of two prayers? Here's the first prayer. It's the first prayer everybody must be certain of, and that's the prayer of repentance and faith, the prayer that opens your heart to Jesus and brings you into a relationship to God. If you're not sure you're saved and you want to be saved and you're willing to trust Christ alone for your salvation, I'm going to invite you to join me in this prayer right now. 
from your heart, would you pray something like this to the Lord? Just make this prayer your own. You're not talking to me. I can't answer your prayer. You're talking to God. He's listening. Pray something like this to the Lord right now. Dear God, right now, dear God, I'm a sinner. And I could never save myself. No one else can save me. But I believe that Jesus is God's Son. I believe He's the Savior. And I want Him to be my Savior. Tell Him right now, I want you to be my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe You died for my sin and rose from the dead. I want You to come into my life. Forgive me. Give me a relationship with God and eternal life. Thank you for taking my place. And thank you for answering this prayer. Help me follow you from this day forward. Our heads are bowed. Nobody's looking at this preacher. We'll give you a verse. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If I gave you a million dollars today, would you be embarrassed? No, you'd be excited. And if you just took Jesus as your Savior, buddy, you got something a whole lot better than a million dollars. You can never spend it up. It's called everlasting life. And I don't think you'll be ashamed to tell me. So I want to ask right now, who in this room would say, Preacher, I prayed that prayer a moment ago with you from my heart to God. And I not only prayed the words, I meant it from my heart. And right where I'm sitting today, I'm trusting Jesus to be my Savior, and I'm not embarrassed to tell you that. I want you to raise your hand big and high in the air with mine right now. Would you please hold it high, as high as you can get it. I see your hands. You say, today, I'm trusting Jesus. With your hand raised, with your hand raised, would you lift your head and look at me just a minute? If your hand is raised, would you look at me? I want to be the first. I see you in each section. I see you. I see you. I want to be the first to congratulate you on the greatest decision you ever made in your life. Are you happy about it? I'm happy for you. Will you trust me on something? I will not embarrass you. Look this way just a moment. I will not embarrass you. Will you trust me? I won't make you give a speech in front of this church. I promise you that. But if you're a man, I'd like a man to have a prayer with you. And if you're a lady, I'd like a lady to have a prayer with you. Somebody that knows the Lord and loves Jesus. And I'd like them to give you something to take home about knowing Jesus as your Savior. Would that be all right? We won't stand you up here and make a spectacle of you, but I want somebody to have a prayer with you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the pastor and his wife if they'll just come right down here in the front with their Bible in hand. And here's what we're going to do. There are men and women here who will pray with you, and we'll do this quickly. Others are going to come and pray in just a moment. You won't be the only people. Sir, you raised your hand and said you prayed to receive Jesus, right? I'm going to ask you to be unashamed to identify with him now. Ma'am, ma'am, I see you, I see you, I see you. Sir, wonderful. Sir, ma'am, I'm going to ask you, Jesus was not ashamed of you when he died on the cross. I'm going to ask you not to be ashamed of him. We're not even going to have any music. So it's just all straight up, no manipulation to it. That's why I've got you looking me in the face. I want you to understand what I'm saying to you. I'm going to count to three. And when I do, those of you that pray today to receive Jesus, I want you just quickly, on the count of three, to leave your seat and come shake the preacher or his wife's hand and say, I'm trusting Jesus today as my Savior. And our personal workers will come to help us. One, two, three. Three, quickly, right now. Would you get up and come? God bless you. Wonderful. Come and tell us. <clears throat> Wonderful. Who else? Today, I'm coming to receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior. Will you come and let us know? Let us have a prayer with you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Wonderful. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sir. That's great, buddy. Amen. Oh, it's great to see people coming to Jesus. That's so good. Who else? <clears throat> say, today I'm coming to be saved. We'll make sure somebody's with everybody, somebody to pray with each person. That's very good. Don't go back to your seat yet here. Help, let the preacher help you. It's wonderful. Good, good, good. Who else? You say, I want to be saved. We're praying all around the building. If you're a Christian, pray for souls right now. Pray for souls. Pray for people that need to be saved. Pray for someone else that may need the Lord. That's wonderful. God bless every one of you. Anybody else like that say, I need to be saved, I need Jesus? Just get up and come. Somebody will meet you here. Somebody will pray with you and help you. Let's take our time with these dear ones. So good, so very good. How many of you saved people are glad to see people getting saved? Yes? Me too. 
All right, let's go a step further. Now I want to speak to all the Christians who are here. If you're a believer, I want to talk to you just a moment. Do you remember when you got saved? Was it a good day? <laughs> Great day. All right, don't you think maybe, maybe we need to recommit ourselves to the Christ who saved us? Don't you think maybe we need to tell him we love him again and draw close to him again? He said, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. I'm going to ask two questions. Here's the first. Speaking to the Christians now. How many people in this room today would say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I'm not living the Christian life. I'm just going to be honest that I'm not living as a dedicated Christian. I'm convicted of it. I want God to forgive me, and I want to recommit my life to Christ as a Christian, already saved, but I want to start living like a true follower of Jesus. That's me. Pray for me. I want you to raise your hand with mine right now, would you please? If you mean it, will you stand to your feet right where you are? Just stand up right where you are, all over the building. Men, women, young people, God bless you. Many of you, amen. You say, that's me, that's me. I'm saved, but today's my day to get serious about following Christ. So good. If you're standing right now, would you lift your head and look at me? Just look this way. Pastor's right here and those who help him. There may be somebody standing. I don't know you. There may be somebody standing that needs to speak to the pastor. Get a little counsel. Let somebody have a prayer with you. If so, he's going to be right here at the front waiting on you. But if you don't need to speak to the preacher, you just need to pray. I'm going to ask you to be the first to lead the charge to an old-fashioned altar. Others will come and pray and join us in this prayer in a moment. But if you're serious and you're able, I'm going to ask you right now, would you just leave your seat and come find your place in this altar? Come tell God what you just told me. The preacher's right here. If you need spiritual counsel and help, speak to him. But if you need to come and kneel, you can sit along the front, stand if you need to, but come find your place to pray. That's wonderful. Wonderful. And then here's our final question and our closing prayer of dedication. How many Christians, I'm speaking now to a lot of faithful believers here today and many members of this church who love Christ. How many of you are with me? I'm going to raise my hand on this first. How many of you are with me and say, Preacher, I do love Jesus, but I want to love him more, and I want this meeting to be a, a fresh start for my walk with Jesus. I want to get closer to the rock again. I want to start following the one who's been following me all these years. Pray for me as a believer to draw nearer to Jesus this week. Would you raise your hand in the air with mine? If you mean it, will you stand to your feet right now as a public testimony? You say, that's what I want. I desire that. I don't want to just play church and go through the motions and have a meeting. I want to meet with God, and I want my life to be different because of it. Oh, it's thrilling, thrilling, thrilling. If you're standing right now, would you look at me? This is revival. People say, what's revival look like? You're looking at it. People getting serious about their walk with Christ. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to begin a prayer. I'm not going to say amen. I'm not ending it, just starting it. When I pause, I'm going to point at the piano. When I do, she's going to begin to play when she hits the first note. If you'll join us in this closing dedication prayer at the beginning of the meeting, I'm going to ask you to leave your place and join those who are here. Let's tell the Lord that we want all he has for us this week. Father, work in our hearts through your word and by your spirit and find here obedient souls. And may we come nearer to Christ than we've ever been. Right now, she begins to play quickly, quietly. Would you just leave your seat? Come find.